Uh, and I now uh, move on to questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. And before uh, no points of order during question time. I will take them immediately afterwards. And, uh, just to inform the members that questions 2 and 12 have been withdrawn. And I call Mr Tom Elliott. Uh, question number one, Principal Deputy Speaker. And with your permission, Ken Corley, I'm going to answer questions 1 and 11 together. Over the last few months, I have met with and listened to farmers, processors, mart operators and the LMC. I've also asked the meat plants to reconsider their position on penalties. I'm very encouraged that all elements of the beef supply chain are committed to working together to address the current difficulties for the benefit of the industry as a whole. I'm hopeful that we are now close to a resolution on these issues which have been causing such a concern to the industry. I welcome the work that the LMC has done in conjunction with the key elements of the beef supply chain to develop a protocol for agreement among the parties. It's a positive step that the Livestock Auctioneers Association has also agreed that Marts will have the discretion to display information on farm residencies. I hope to see processors significantly reduce their penalties on cattle with over four farm residencies to the end of the year as has been proposed. My department is willing to work with herd keepers and marts to explore the information about cattle residencies that could be accessed as simply as possible and, and has already committed to commence some work to bring about the changes to APHIS. To assist herd keepers immediately and until residencies can be displayed electronically in markets, my department will provide a report to the keeper on request listing all the animals in the, in the keeper's herd. And that's report, this report will keep, um, provides keepers with full movement history for their herd and can be obtained from local dart direct. And I call Mr. Elliott for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that update. Uh, not sure all the, the farmers and market owners would agree that uh, it seems to be moving proactively, but could the Minister indicate she did say that uh, she was hoping for an outcome in, in the near future? Would that outcome result with uh, the number of residencies being allowed to be increased to those retailers or indeed removed altogether? I don't think there's any hope of them being removed, but I think certainly things are moving in the right direction. And what we're seeking is actually confirmation from those people that they won't um, introduce further changes. You'll be aware from the LMC protocol, which they published over, recent, over the recent last month, um, it clearly sets out that there's need to be um, communication right across the supply chain. The reason that farmers ended up in such difficulty in this time is because these changes were brought in without any um, further uh, or any sort of pre-warning in, ter in terms of the changes to, to residency. So, one of the things that the LMC clearly set out in the protocol, and there is positive, um, uh, I think, contribution to, to, in response to the LMC protocol, it says that if there are going to be market changes, if there are going to be changes to the specifications, these need to be communicated well in advance so farmers take decisions based on the knowledge that they know that's into the foreseeable future. So I am I'm pleased with that piece of work. All the, as I said, the mood music is good, however, there's been no formal um, sign-off on, on the protocol, but I'm hopeful that will happen in the time ahead. And we are seeking um, assurances that there will be no um, further calls for, from the, the major retailers to reduce the residencies any further. I think four is reasonable, and I know that, particularly given the type of farming that we have, it will be very, very difficult for um, our farmers to be able to, uh, to put up with anything that was any more than that. I call Mr Joe Byrne. Mr Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer. Would the Minister agree that DARD needs to be centrally driving this on behalf of the farming community? And would she also agree that in the current situation, many of these beef farmers are caught in a lumber position and that they need relief currently in order to address the issue? I do agree. And, and as I've said, I, mean, I, I think the way that this was brought in was unfortunate, to say the least, and it left some farmers who had bought cattle at high prices last year for finishing uh, and then were left in a situation where they had nowhere to go with them. So what, what we're, I suppose what I'm pleased to see is that um, some of the main processors or all the main processors have appear, or appear to be joining up to a protocol that will allow a period up until the end of the year, the start of January, to allow farmers to be able to adapt and then we'll have a new system from going on. We need to have these penalties reduced. Farmers cannot be caught out because of a change that these people brought in without forewarning them of, of the change. I call Mr. Cahill Boyle. I'm going to prove in Yaskin Corlea. Could I ask the Minister how long will it take to make changes to the Avis system or Mill Market? We want to be able to get things moving, and part of the, the agreement that um, has been established with um, LMCs. Uh, taking the lead, with LMC taking the lead has been that we'll be able to, uh, the Livestock and Auctioneers Association will allow March to display the information. We're going to work our way through that, but it is through um, a uh, computer system that we need to make the changes. So um, 
we will be doing that, but in the meantime, we'll also work with the March to actually give them um, a physical copy of, uh, of the information that they need until such times of, as we have the changes secured. And what we're talking about is six months actually for the AFA system to be um, formulated and the specifications required. But I have prioritised this piece of work with my department and asked them to make sure that we deliver on our, um, our end of, of making sure that we can resolve the situation. So that's why we've taken a two-pronged two approach in that will physically help them until we can actually get the information on the AFA system. And I call Mr. Jim Allister. Has the department considered or taken any advice upon whether this price cutting ploy would be anti-competitive in terms of EU law? It's not something that's been brought to my attention. I think that it's unfortunate, as I said, to say the least, how the, the marks have went about, or how not the marks, how the processors have went about bringing in these changes. I think it's been very clear, and one, I suppose, one positive thing that's come out of this recent conversation is the fact that unless there's fairness right across the supply chain, unless there's communication right across the supply chain, we're not going to have a sustainable farming system into the future and be able to target all those markets that we're going after. Uh, but in terms of um, EU, uh, whether or not it's anti-competitive, no, that's not been an issue that's been raised. Thank you. And the comments are Roy Beggs. Question number three. Again, can I call you with your permission, I'm going to answer questions three and five together. As part of the decisions on cap reform, I received executive agreement to a budget of up to 623 million for the next RDP. This is an increase in funding of almost 16% compared to the current programme and gives us the largest RDP we have ever had. It will allow us to deliver a broad range of measures to improve the competitiveness of our farm and agri-food businesses, protect and enhance our environment and improve the quality of life in rural communities. I intend to match the EU funds pound for pound with 186.5 million of my department's own resource. The provision of this match funding will be a high priority to ensure that we will maximise the EU funds available. The agreement secured with the executive will provide additional funding of up to £250 million to fund the proposed Farm Business Improvement Scheme, as was requested by the Agri-Food Strategy Board. This additional funding will help me to deliver on the aims and objectives of the Going for Growth report. In July, I announced further detail on the proposed allocations for schemes within the programme. My officials are working to finalise the draft programme in conjunction with the RDP Stakeholder Consultation Group. Formal submission to the EU Commission is expected in October. And I call Mr. Roy Beggs for a supplementary. Much of the Rural Development Programme 2014-2020 uh, is aspirational, with money still to be committed to in any, any budget, yet with considerable health pressures intolerable, and there are cutbacks being implemented by every department, including her own. So my question is, can the Minister advise how the current um, cuts in her department as a result of the failure to maintain welfare parity are, uh, will affect the uh, Rural Development Programme during this year, and what effect does she foresee it having in the future when there will be much larger cutbacks that she will have to implement in her department? As I said in my original answer, I intend to prioritise this area of work, and it's vital that we do that, and, and the executive will be cutting off its face, <laughs> its nose its face if it wasn't to look at this piece of work, because this is us enhancing European money. It gets us, uh, doubles, our, doubles our money. So for me, this is a priority. This is about the executive very clearly saying that they have a commitment and invest and want to invest in rural communities. So I am delighted that back in June that we got the commitment that we did to secure up to £623 million of a new rural development programme, which is going to be vital. So as I said, I will be prioritising that. There's no impact whatsoever in this year's funding. All that funding has been allocated. The programme is about to um, come to the end of its, uh, of, of its current life, and we'll be looking towards our new programme for next year. And as I said, we're already budgeting for the, the money that I've, that I've set out. I call Mr Declan McAleer. When does the Minister expect the new programme to get off the ground for delivery? Margaret? Well, I, th I think it's vitally important that we learn lessons um, from the previous programme which we inherited where th there was, um, I suppose, everybody can agree that there was very much a slow start. So I want to be able to get things off the ground as soon as possible. The first stage in order for us to be able to do that is that we achieve EU approval for the programme. So we intend to go to Europe in October. We've actually been working with EU officials as we develop our programme, and we're hopeful and, um, that we'll be able to get that turned around pr um, pretty quickly, certainly at the start of next year. I have impressed on Dacia Anchilis, who's the EU Commissioner, the need for us to be able to have our programme cleared and turned around as quickly as possible so that we can um, have clarity on, our EU, on the EU rules, have clarity on our programme, and then we get things up and running as, as soon as possible. My aim would be that we will be recruiting 
um, for the new lags uh, towards the end of the year, actually have them in place by the end of the year, and then all the work can start around animation. And I think it's particularly a good time in, in that we have um, the new council structures actually out consulting on community plans over that time. And I think these are two programmes which can very much um, dovetail and assist each other. Thank you. And I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number four to the Minister. I'm delighted that the Executive has endorsed the growth aspirations of the industry as set out in the Going for Growth and agreed a proposed response to as part of the package of significant support on CAP and the Rural Development Programme announced at the end of June 2014. Since then, my officials have been working with colleagues across the Executive Departments to refresh and update the response prior to publication to take account of the various actions which have already taken place. Progress has been made on a number of fronts. For example, we have developed our new Rural Development Programme, which contains a, a range of new support schemes to address the aims and objectives of going for growth, including a business, farm business improvement scheme and an agri-food um, process and investment scheme. We have deferred introduction of charges for export health certificates for meat and dairy products. An appointments process for the TB Strategic Partnership has been underway. We have launched the All Island Clara Control Strategy, increased the number of DARD-funded postgraduate co courses our places launched a further tranche of the Research Challenge Fund and appointed a contact point at AFBI to assist researchers and businesses in making applications to EU research funding programmes. We have also opened a third tranche of the manure of the MET scheme and with DETI and Invest in I we have jointly launched a loan scheme to support the sustainable use of poultry litter. So my department will continue to work with the other government departments and industry representatives to drive forward the implementation but I am sure the member will agree there has been good progress to date. I call Mr. McCarthy for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President, and I do welcome the Minister's um, report to the Executive. Uh, but in all of her, her uh, statement uh, just now, uh, she has not mentioned the fisheries. Uh, the Minister will be aware that the fisheries is a vital uh, part in any uh, of our rural economy. Can the Minister outline the progress on the commitment to grow the fisheries and to um, See if the £90 million pound that was promised is on target for that particular uh, industry. I assure the member that I am committed to ensuring that we have a sustainable and um, thriving fishing industry into the future. And we have um, quite a number of areas of work that are going on at, at this moment in time, particularly around European funding and, and making sure that we have, I think, more interaction. If you'll be aware that I established a task force which was to look um, to work um, more with the fishing community on the ground around how they can access the European funding and this new round of funding, and that works on underway. There are a number of um, key or, or um, directed actions in the Going for Growth document which are directed to fisheries, and I can assure you that they are receiving as much attention as, as any of the other ones that I've, I've mentioned here today. It is vitally important, and even given um, the recent Russian ban on food imports that will have an impact slightly on some of our fishing community here. So we're making sure that we're to the fore of um, championing the needs of our local industry. And I call Oliver McMullen for supplement. Can the minister provide more detail on the proposed farm business investment scheme? The Farm Business Improvement Scheme is a key recommendation under the Going for Growth strategy and reflects a clear need for farmers to be provided with capital, advisory and training support to invest in their farm businesses and improve their efficiency and their competitiveness. The Executive has agreed a proposed budget for the scheme of £250 million, which will be delivered via the Rural Development Programme. My officials are continuing to develop the details of the scheme and the necessary business cases, building on the Agri-Food Strategy Board's views and responses we have received during the consultation on the RDP and from the stakeholder consultation group. The scheme is intended to provide support for increasing farm production sustainably and by improving competitiveness through efficiency, integrating the supply chain and adapting to market requirements. An important element would be um, support for training and learning, new skills and to ensure that the industry can benefit from the transfer of new innovative technologies and adapt to the changing needs of the industry. I call Ms Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I also thank the Minister for her answers? But does she share my concern and the concern of the industry at the much delayed funding agreement for Going for Growth? And can, can she inform the House how she feels this has impacted targets which the Agri Food Board would have anticipated to have met in 2014-2015? Well, the member might want to catch up because the executive agreed the position and agreed the funding package for the Going for Growth um, document back in June 
I think it was the 26th. And as I've just outlined, out, outlined there are the range of issues that have actually happened in the absence of all of that. So we weren't sitting back waiting for the package. The package and the financial support was obviously key in terms of being able to develop and devise a programme. It greatly enhanced the rural development programme. We now have a greater rural development programme than we've ever had before. But as I said, we um, have moved on with quite a number of, of issues which I have already outlined in the initial answer to, to Mr McCarthy. So a lot of progress has been made and it's important that we build on this progress and we use what is there. This is a thriving industry that with the right support can continue to grow and that's the executive I think is very clearly put on record and send a very strong message to the industry that they are interested in supporting this industry by the, by the executive agreement that we achieved back in June. And I call Mr Basil McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, would the Minister give an assessment of how AFBE will play a role in growing for growth and what steps has she taken to address the projected 25% reduction in budget in the next three or four years? In terms of AFBE, AFBE are obviously a key player in terms of moving forward and um, there is no doubt that in terms of uh, and core and central to the work of the Going for Growth is the work that AFBE do. AFBE take about 18% of my resource budget a year, so we have a very strong um, ethos in terms of building on research, and I think that we need to continue to do that in the time ahead. Um, I'm sure the members are referring to a recent um, media article where there was talk in relation to the AFBE budget, but I can assure the member that I'm committed to invest in research. The executive has, a, has a, a, a commitment to increase our drawdown of European funding. I think AFBE are a fantastic vehicle to be able to do that, and have been out in Europe making sure that um, they're, they're um, being in touch with funding partners and people that they can work with. So, AFBE are looking, like, like all departments, given the financial challenges that are uh, impressed upon all of us, uh, the AFBE, like other elements of my department, are looking at their budget and where they need to prioritise their work. And work will be ongoing between myself and themselves on how we actually um, look at and how we prioritise the areas of work that they focus on. And you'll be aware that the work that they do is quite wide ranging, everything from plant health, animal health, and right through. So it's important that, in terms of moving forward, that the work that AFBE do aligns with the work that the industry requires to help us to be able to grow forward. And that's a conversation that's ongoing. Thank you. And I call Mr. Pat Ramsey. Question six, Deputy Principal Speaker. A new agri-environment scheme, the Environmental Farming Scheme, is being developed. The scheme will provide support to farmers and land managers to carry out environmentally beneficial farming practices. These practices will aim to preserve and enhance biodiversity, improve the quality of our water, air and soil, create small woodlands and help to mitigate against climate change. The proposed scheme will have three levels, a targeted level, primarily for environmentally designated sites, a wider level to deliver benefits across the countryside, outside of environmentally designated areas, and a group level to support a cooperative action by farmers in specific areas such as river catchment or commonages. It's planned that the Rural Development Programme proposals will be submitted to the European Commission in October, and Commission approval can normally be expected around six months following the submit, or submission. However, we've been um, in some indications that that will be sooner. So subject to the Commission um, clearance, the necessary IT and control systems being in place, it's planned to launch the scheme in the second half of 2015, with the first Environmental Farming Scheme Agreement commencing in January 2016. Following the initial um, launch, the scheme will then open in further tranches. Mr Ramsey for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for her detailed response. Could I ask the Minister, could she assure the House that it's going to have the most effective practical control measures but not be overburdened by uh, bureaucratic systems? Absolutely, and uh, um, it's something that um, the department in the past has been accused of as being um, over-bureaucratic. We have to obviously meet um, the needs of what the European Commission asked for, given that they are giving us um, such a large pot of money. But I can assure the member that there's no intention or no will from the department to want to, to make it over cumbersome for people. We want to be able to um, have great uptake of these schemes. We, we, we are fantastic. Farmers are fantastic custodians of the countryside. So I think it's right that they should be um, rewarded, rewarded for that. But as I say, we'll work within the, the, the rules set down by Europe. We will we'll obviously, obviously always try to not be over bureaucratic about it. And I call Mr Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I wonder, would the Minister give us her assessment of the organic management scheme and the previous countryside management scheme and why she thinks that uptake was so poor? It's, it's hard to know. It's, um, it's a farmer's individual decision as to whether or not they want to participate in the scheme. That scheme has been um, 
run out quite some time ago now. I don't have the detail with me, but I'm happy to provide it for the member. But I think it's a combination of reasons as to why we didn't have uptake. Maybe farmers didn't feel that there was a market for, for the produce that they would produce, that they would get the, the, the value for, for what to produce. I have visited some organic farms and have seen fantastic practices. However, it is, I suppose, a consumer choice as to whether or not they want to pay more. So I think there's a combination of, of reasons. Um, one of the things that we looked at in shaping the new programme was whether or not there would be um, a need to, to develop another programme and going forward. Unfortunately, stakeholder, there wasn't a demand for it at this moment in time, but um, I'm sure if, if in the future that that there was a, a change in consumer um, practice, consumer needs or wants, then um, we can certainly look at it again. I'll call Mr. Ian Mill. Glasgow Collier. I'd like to ask the Minister, will the scheme contain support for traditional breeds of cattle? Carmilla Muggett. Yes, it's intended that the, farming, the environmental farming scheme will contain support for the Irish moil cattle, and that's the only um, breed that's actually native to the north of Ireland. So it, it's on the Rare Breed Survival Trust, their watch list, so we thought it would be um, important in moving forward that we have something that's specific f for those cattle. Thank you. And I call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Gordon Mulligan, a free last year on the call. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Kirst Evershach, the Dahal. Question number seven, please. I have been acutely aware that the beef from cattle born in the south and slaughtered in the north cannot be labelled with a single country of origin, and that beef from these so called nomads has a lower market value than British or Irish origin beef. I have been very concerned about the impact of the, British, of the price penalties applied for these animals, both for individual farmers and the wider beef industry. I am of the strong view that the term nomad cattle has no place in this island. Following discussions with industry stakeholders and Minister Coveney in the South, I have approved an application made to DARD under the Voluntary Beef Labelling Scheme to allow a local processor to use the term Irish to label beef from such cattle. I am hopeful that this will open up new markets for local processors with British retailers. It should also assist the long-standing tradition of cattle um, across the island of Ireland, particularly stored cattle coming from the west of Ireland for finishing and slaughter in the north. Minister Coveney and I have also written jointly to the major retailers on the issue. We have asked them to consider how beef from cattle born in the south and slaughtered in the north could be marketed so that it was not at a disadvantage in terms of the UK retail market for beef origin originating on the island of Ireland. I intend to follow this up in the coming weeks, and we all want to see sustainable and profitable beef sector, and I will continue to work closely with industry stakeholders and ministry, Minister Coveney in support of that. I call Mr McGlone for the supplementary. Um, Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I think the, the Minister as well for a comprehensive reply there. Uh, could the Minister tell me just please um, if there's any indication as to what time frame you're going to be working in with Minister Coveney? And I take it uh, thankfully from your response that, that he too is very positive in his approach to this issue and, and all our interests. Yes, absolutely. We've had um, quite a number of conversations in relation to the issue and, and met in person. We have both jointly written to um, all the major retailers if we think that together we would be a stronger political voice in, in raising the issue with them. Um, in terms of a resolution, I, I'm, I'm led to believe that it should be over the next number of weeks if, if there is a market to be found, and I think that would be very positive news for the industry. This is a long-established trade which needs to continue. It's something that's happened for, for many, many years, particularly the West of Ireland um, cattle coming up for, for finishing. So we don't want to see that interrupted, and I know that um, particularly, again, this was another issue that was um, major for the beef industry this year, given that um, people were caught out again and, and, and couldn't um, uh, dispose of their cattle. So um, I, I'm confident that, um, together with uh, Minister Coveney, that we can bring strong political influence to the issue and, and deal with the retailers. Call Mr Robin Swan. Thanks, Sir. Minister, can you give this House some reassurance that any cattle entering the Northern Ireland meat chain through this scheme still retains its traceability? and that there will be steps taken to strengthen to make sure that this meat can no way enhance or encourage the smuggling operation that is taking place at this minute in time and make it easier so we can reassure processors and indeed the general market that Northern Ireland beef is safe to eat. I, I hope the member isn't scaremongering because I can absolutely 100 per cent give a guarantee that there is full traceability in all of this beef. Um, the only additionality to the beef would be that there will be a label that says Irish. But, um, the EU regulations suggest that you have to have where it was born, where it was reared and where it was slaughtered. 
but the beef can also now say Irish. But full traceability is absolutely there. That is something that was, was our strength over the horse meat crisis. That is something that Minister Coveney and I are very keen to make sure that there's, there will be no interruption of in terms of um, securing an additional label. This is just merely to accommodate the trade that, that happens on this island. I call Mr. McGee Brady. Carl Weingott, uh, Preve Laskin Cordia. Thank the Minister for her answers. Could I ask the Minister how does she propose to encourage uh, retailers to begin to accept the new labels? Carl Weingott. I, um, along with Minister Coveney, have, have written to all the major retailers. I've met a number of them, and he and I intend to meet them together to impress on them the fact that this is a traditional trade that happens, that there is full traceability in the meat, and we intend to meet them. Um, I'm hopeful that, that will be over the next month that we'll be able to secure a meeting with all, all the major retailers, because I think it's important that we impress on them that this is traditional trade, that our aspiration and, and we're working actively towards free movement of cattle right across this island. This island. I don't think any consumer um, would, would have a problem with, with beef that's um, born in, in, in Cork and slaughtered in, in, in Urie. I don't think there's a, an issue there for a consumer. So we want to impress that upon these retailers over the next number of weeks. Thank you. And I call Mr Ross Hussey. It's, it's perfectly... Quick question yet, Minister. Rivers Agency has permissive powers under the terms of the Drainage Order 1973 to carry out maintenance to designated watercourses to ensure that they are free flowing and perform their drainage function. Designated open watercourses are routinely, routinely inspected, with those benefiting rural areas typically on a six year rolling inspection programme, and urban watercourses inspected and maintained annually. Watercourses which are prone to um, siltation or dumping are inspected and maintained more frequently. Where designated water course is um, culverted, it is inspected on a three-year cycle. In addition, culvert inlet grills are inspected and maintained on a frequent basis, many of them weekly. Additional grill inspections are also undertaken when heavy rainfall is forecast and after flood events, as debris can often be carried downstream by high river flows causing obstructions. In assessing maintenance needs, consideration is given to whether any obstruction to flow or reduction in channel dimensions will have a significant impact on the drainage function of the water course or increase flood risk. The Drainage Order 1973 does not empower Rivers Agency to carry out maintenance for any other purpose, such as the removal of litter or improvement of water quality. Mr Hussey, for a supplement. Do, does the Minister agree with me that the totally disjointed cross-departmental responsibility for our waterways is impeding their protection and operation, and would you now at last agree with the merit in the proposal to transfer the Rivers Agency to the Department of Regional Development? Well, I don't think that it's totally disjointed work, and I think that past events have shown how the departments work very closely together, and um, quite often, with, um, depending on how the flooding has occurred, if it's from rivers with my department in the lead, or from surface flooding if it's road service in the lead. So I think there's very clear practical examples of how um, departments have worked together. I've always said that I'm open to the PEDGE report where it looked at one body taking the lead. I've always said that I'm very open to that. Um, in terms of a wider review of executive departments. So I don't have a closed mind to it, but I, I don't think it's fair to say that there isn't good um, cross-departmental work in terms of flooding, and past practice has shown that that's the case. Mr Gordon Dunn, for supplementary. Well, Deputy Speaker, and can the Minister advise us if the Rivers Agency have increased their staff, the resources that are available to deal with especially flash flooding, which we have experienced in recent years? We don't have an issue with staff in terms we, we actually have recruited numbers of staff, I don't have the numbers to hand, but I can certainly provide them over the last number of years. But um, our, our priority is to make sure that in terms of what is set out under the, or, the drainage order, that we make sure that rivers are clean, that we inspect them annually and that there's no flooding unnecessarily because of work that hasn't been done. In areas where there was um, a need to maybe enhance inspections, we've been able to deploy the staff that we have on the ground. But I can provide the, the member in writing the number of staff that we've um, employed over the last couple of years. And can I call Mr John Dallet? Uh, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, I, I thank the Minister for her answer. The, the Minister may well be aware that at the height of the building boom, many rivers were, con were piped and culverts then created. But these culverts are not being checked on a regular basis. And there's a question mark over whose responsibility is. I simply ask the Minister, will she investigate this? And will she ensure that where these culverts exist, that whole neighbourhoods are not uh, threatened uh, with flooding because one department doesn't accept, another doesn't accept, the things are not adopted, and neighbourhoods are li living in fear. 
Um, I, I can surely um, make sure that we investigate that on a more, even on a constituency level, of, in, of, in, of cases where developers have gone bust and people have been left in a, in a particularly difficult situation. I know how difficult it is to get um, someone to take ownership. So, if, in terms of my department's role and what we do, I'll certainly take a look at that. Well, sir, I order members that uh, ends the period for questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, can I ask what steps you are taking, or indeed intend to take, uh, to support the agriculture uh, industry in light of the impact that the Russian import ban is having on farmers and processors here in Northern Ireland? Yes, I mean, um, in terms of the impact, it's particularly affecting our dairy industry, we're, when we're quite concerned in, in terms of um, how the ban will impact on other sectors uh, 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 further down the line. Um, it's, as I said, it's mainly affected our dairy industry, it's mainly affected cheese. Um, last week, I went out to Brussels and, and um, uh, took part in the EU um, special meeting that they, they convened all the member states together to, t to talk about the, the issue. I made sure that um, I impressed on both the DEFRA Secretary of State, who um, I was also attending meetings with, um, the need for, for our industry to be protected, that there needed to be immediate and timely supports where appropriate, and also that we needed to be finding new markets for those products that would have um, traditionally been going there. So whilst there may be a, a smaller impact in terms of, of the, the number of businesses immediately affected, I think there are reverberations further down the line that, that, that may cause problems for us. And I also think that um, in terms of um, finding new markets, then that needs to be a key priority in going forward. Anderson for a supplement. Thank you, um, and thank you, Minister, for that response. And Minister, in your response, you did uh, mention that you did meet uh, uh, the Secretary of State uh, for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, uh, Elizabeth Truss, last week. Uh, but uh, I take it you were lobbying for support on that occasion, and I hope you were. And do you have any further intentions, maybe, to meet with her to try and get support, in particular, for the introduction of export refunds for the dairy industry, as you, you talk about? And, and I'm sure the member will be very aware that um, my political position and my um, ideology in terms of EU and how they support the industry will be very different to Elizabeth Truss's. But I made it very clear that I think that any supports that are there in terms of what the EU can provide, then I think they need to be timely and they need to be appropriate. I welcome the fact that the EU have already taken steps in terms of storage. But I do think that it's important that, as we've seen in the past, where the EU sits back and waits till it's too late, and industry is already detrimentally affected. I made that case very strongly with Elizabeth, and I also was in the meeting with Commissioner Chillis where we made that case, and I made the case for our local industry. So um, what we have to do now is, I suppose, watch very closely the market and watch how this is going to impact on other sectors. It's also disappointing, I think, for a number of industries, particularly pork um, and beef and, and the pet food sector, actually, even also who are targeting Russia as a market. So that's obviously going to cause setbacks for, for those people um, in the immediate future, anyway. Thank you. And question two has been withdrawn, and I call Mr. Cahill O'Hashin. Uh, with the brief last inquiry, could I ask the Minister how is the TVR project uh, progressing? Um, well, the member will be aware that the project commenced back in, in May this year in the 100 km squared area around Ban Bridge, and it's going to run for five years and end in late 2018. Um, TVR, as a research project, is um, to provide much needed information on badgers and on the TVR approach. It's not a pilot, and it's not being attempted anywhere else. Um, no badger will be removed this year, and all badgers will, that are captured will be sampled, microchipped, vaccinated, and released. And actually, I went out on to um, the, the site actually to see for myself just the work that's ongoing. And the project is certainly going very well. I know the vets are very enthusiastic about the work that they're doing and, very, and absolutely very passionate about it. So I think good progress is, is, is being made. However, it's too early actually just, to, I suppose, to be statistically um, given information just in terms of, of the actual project itself because we're too early and only, and only been a number of months into the project. Mr. Hashim, for a supplement. Uh, the previous asking the is going based in IRS of Denagrishan. Can I ask the Minister what has been the uptake in the areas where the project has been implemented? Um, it's, it's actually been very, very good. The Department has written to all the landowners and we've had very positive response. And our departmental researchers are actually presently calling with farmers and landowners in the Banbridge TVR area to obtain the permissions and to access the land and conduct the TV activities over the next five years. So I think we're sitting at somewhere around about 93% of farmers have, have responded in the TVR area have given their permission to allow the department to access their land. So we're very, very grateful for that. And I obviously encourage all the remaining farmers to also get involved and give their permission for department staff to access their land. Thank you. And I call Mr. Phil Flanagan. Premier, I got the, the Minister announced um, that 
Forest Service headquarters are to relocate to Fermanagh. Um, and I'm just wondering if the Minister can give us some information on, on the date of when this move will take place. Yes, well, I'm, I'm pleased to say that the Headquarter Relocations Team has prepared a, a project, project plan with key stages identified for an expected move by June next year, so June 2015. Um, the Department has worked very closely with DFP's Property um, Division to complete an appraisal of Inishkeen House in Asgillen to consider the viability of placing more Forest Service staff in Inishkeen House. The first phase of that work is complete and it's confirmed that Inishkeen House can potentially accommodate more staff. And the indications are that with an internal redesign, um, Forest Service headquarters staff could be accommodated there. So I'm very pleased with that and I can assure the member that we're on target uh, and working very hard to be able to deliver the project and for staff to be there for June of next year. Mr Flanagan for a supplement. For me, I got the, uh, for your last control, it's good to get good news about here the odd time. Um, there's considerable interest um, amongst people that are employed in the, the public sector in Fermanagh, and an awful lot of them have to travel to Belfast and places like it to, to get employment. So can the Minister outline how many jobs in total we're, we're talking about here that, that will be moving or made available in Fermanagh? Well, um, there's 65 in total going to the Fermanagh to Forest Service, and obviously the member will be aware of all the other relocations with fisheries going to South Down, Rivers Agency going to Lockery and Cookstown. Um, and these are all positive, and, and obviously Dart headquarters going to, to Bally Kelly. So um, we're on target for all of those. There's a lot of work going on, and it's about making sure that staff feel comfortable in, in all of the moves that are happening. And that's why we have a, a significant lead-in time to allow for, for all that to happen. So it's, it's all very positive stuff. Thank you. And uh, Mr. McNary is not in his place, but in fairness to Mr. McNary, he did contact the business office, but just outside the time allowed for withdrawal of questions. I call Ms Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to outline the relationship between planning and her department, in particular Rivers Agency, when consulted upon by planning service? Yes, I mean, I can provide more detail in writing just to the specifics, but um, there's a relationship in terms of um, applications that come forward. They may at times consult Rivers, Rivers Agency and they will um, assist them in terms of um, mapping designs and whatever, whatever they've been asked for at the time. There's been instances in the past where, for example, there's been objections to planning and maybe Rivers Agency have to get involved in terms of um, providing what they feel is maybe potential or, or problematic areas. I thank the Minister for her answer. In Lisbon, it is my experience and the reality that we may lose a multi-million pound investment because investors cannot wait in Rivers Agency responding to planning service applications that will bring much needed investment into Ligon Valley. Delays from Rivers have had a detrimental effect. What can you do, Minister, to ensure that the Rivers Agency will prioritise such applications? I'm hopeful that the member has um, dealt with Rivers Agency directly and spoken to them, but I'm happy to talk to the member outside of the room just in terms of a local constituency issue. Thank you. I call Ms Rosalind McCorley. Can I ask the Minister for an update on the relocation of her departmental headquarters to Bally Kelly? Yes, um, as I said in the previous answer, we're, we're delighted to be moving forward with the project. Um, we have had executive sign off on the project back in June, and we're on schedule um, for the relocation. It's so important, and I mean, I know in terms of Ballykelly area and the wider rural community, it's fantastic to see the executive committing to the rural area to a fair distribution of public sector jobs. So that's something that I'm passionate about and making sure that we, take, we get this um, project right and we move it forward because this will be the first department to move lock, stock and barrel out of the Greater Belfast area. So it's important that we, we lead the way and hopefully other departments will then follow. So we're on schedule for our first um, cohort of staff to, to move. Um, in 2017 and then the rest over the next um, number of years after that. So um, work has progressed nicely. We're ensuring that we're engaging with staff and um, we're also on target, as I said, for all the other projects um, in terms of moving fisheries, rivers agency and forestry. Um, just um, the, the minister uh, referred to um, the relationship with staff. Uh, can I just ask, are staff content that they're being properly informed? Um, I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that staff are, are content um, by and large. Um, we have made sure that we have an ad hoc committee and we meet with Trade Union side right through the process because it's so important that we get this right. Inevitably, DART headquarters is, has been where it is for about 50 years, so 
quite a number of the staff that work there are from the Greater Belfast area, so it's understandable that those people wouldn't want to move. I think the fact that we're taking the project forward the way we are is allowing for those changes to happen, for people to move in and out of Dard. So I think that, or I hope that that will um, accommodate as many staff as possible. I've always said that we wouldn't um, want to, we would never want to be in a position where we forced anybody to move. But as I said, with the right forward planning, which I think we have in place, with the continued engagement with the trade and union side and with the staff on the ground, I think that, um, that they, I would hopeful that they'd be confident that um, they're, they're kept informed of everything as it happens and they've been given every opportunity to, to um, create a, a solution for themselves that, that creates hopefully a good work-life balance for them. Thank you. And I call Mr Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I wonder would the Minister advise the House on the action taken by her department to address the serious decline in insect pollinators in Northern Ireland? I don't have any detail with me um, on that, but I'm very happy to provide it to the, to the member in writing. In term, and if you want to be more specific, if you wanted to um, contact private office, I'm happy to give him whatever, whatever information he needs. Three for supplementary. <laughs> yes, thank you uh, again. Uh, certainly, uh, that would be very welcome. I wonder, the Minister will remember that this House encouraged the development of a bee health strategy a couple of years ago. Again, perhaps you could tell us, or if she doesn't have the information to hand, let me know just what work has been done by her department on the development of that strategy. I'm aware of concerns in relation to the population, the bee population. So, yes, um, some work has been done on that, but I, again, I'll provide the member with that in writing. Thank you. And I'll call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister um, give us any further information on what has been done to increase farm safety, especially in relation to slurry handling? And has any work been done in relation to the possibility of a device, a warning device for farmers, warning them of toxic fumes when, uh, during slurry handling operations? Well, my department plays a very active role with the health and safety executive in terms that they are the lead in terms of farm safety. And we're very keen to work with all the industry partners, particularly the farming unions. We've all come together in terms of promoting a very, um, the message think safe and, and for farmers to think before. And it is a very dangerous profession, as we all know. There's an aging population in the farming community. These are all factors that need to be taken into account. But in terms of the actual device itself, um, there are concerns that that would become a, a falsity, that, that people would rely on it, farmers would rely on it, and maybe it's not calibrated right. There are, there are particular concerns with actually that device. HSE aren't keen for, it, for that to be something that's rolled out. If it was the case, then certainly we would be wanting to encourage uptake of that in whatever way we could. But at this moment in time, that's not the, the solution that, that has been identified by either industry or the Health and Safety Executive. Thank you, and I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thanks, for Mr. Supplement Principal Deputy Speaker. Mm -hmm. I may thank the Minister too for her answer. But just a follow up from that, has the Department perhaps involved universities or anyone else in research and development in trying to come up with equipment that would be suitable? Because it is, a, um, unfortunately, it's a regular occurrence now in Northern Ireland deaths from slurry and will continue to be, obviously, with the, the large dairy sector that we have. And we do feel that there, surely there is a need for someone to look at this and perhaps uh, come up with a proper design, something that will be effective and be efficient and be strong and portable to uh, carry out this operation. How has that uh, aspect been looked at? I can assure you that um, all those things are being looked at through the auspices of the Health and Safety Executive. If there was a solution that, that we could provide, I have no doubt that we would have it. So that the work isn't there yet to say that that, 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 that is the, the definitive solution. So I think there are a number of things that we need to be doing along the way, particularly around grant aid, for example, for slurry, for making sure that tanks are safe and, and all of those things. So we can do all of that, but we, we await um, the Health and Safety Executive approval of a device of that nature. And I have no doubt that they're consulting universities and have other researchers involved in, in um, researching the safety and then, um, because it's so important that we don't just put a stick and plaster on something that could be a bigger issue. So it's important that we get it right. Thank you. And I call Mr. Pat Sheehan again. I have a free last count, Corla. Uh, could the Minister give us uh, the current uh, update on the impact of ash dieback? The 2014 survey of ash is completed. Um, 406 out of the planned 1,000 inspections. 
and that survey is taken in the recently planted sites of ash in public and private woodland, roadside plantings, established trees and hedgerows, and ongoing nursery surveillance. Any sus suspect trees found are sampled and undergo laboratory testing for the ash dieback pathogen, and we are adopting a risk-based, intelligent-led, targeted approach. Our 2014 survey has found only two new infections with no evidence that the disease is circulating in the wider environment. So I suppose that's, that's positive in itself. However, current scientific understanding suggests that the conditions for spread in the wider environment exist right across the island of Ireland. And two wider environment sites have been identified in the south in last year, actually, when action was taken to destroy the mature ash in hedge groves and associated ash debris affected by the disease. So we continue to remain vigilant and continue to survey for this um, serious disease. Order. Uh, time is up. I see Ms. Anna